welcome to Abilene Bible and welcome to our communion. And uh, uh, let's, let's give God a moment of silence, confessing our sins, then we'll get ready to be refilled by God. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we come to your throne of glory, majesty, and grace. We are here to commemorate the new covenant that you have bestowed unto us through your Son, your only eternal Son, your only begotten Son, who is divine and who became a man because of obedience to you and the love for the elect, the betrothed bride of Christ. He is Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Thanks to your gift and his sacrifice, now we have received eternal life as promised through your word. We have received the Holy Spirit who lives in our regenerated human spirit. It was dead, but now alive. We have read your word, the inspired, the word of God, which is inerrant. And then we have understood its key message that by our simple faith in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, we can have salvation, eternal life, the possibility of sanctification, and the promised re uh, the glorification. And all of this are your grace. You are a God of might, a God of love, and a God of grace. And it's through our faith in your grace, in Christ Jesus, we now have the truth, we have the life, and we have the way. Thank you. We are here to not only thank you, but also to confess. We are sorry that we have not became, become perfect as we should be and could be. Because if we have listened to the Holy Spirit in all the things we thought and said and did, we would have been totally righteous, acting out in integrity and then showing the life of Christ in us to let others see us. But there are moments and times and even periods of times when we fall short of that. And we know that is real, though it can be eliminated, but in reality, often they're not. So we're here to confess. We know that is not ideal. We know that you didn't desire it. We know that it didn't fit our identity in Christ Jesus. We're here to confess. We're here to pray that you will forgive our sins as you have promised in Christ. We're pray, praying that you will cover us with grace, with the blood of Jesus, so that you will not see the sin in us and you rather will see the life of Christ in us. And you will see perfection not because of who we are and what we did, but because of who we are through Christ. Now our essential identity has changed. Our spirit now is holy because your Holy Spirit lives in us. For all of that, we are grateful. We pray by through your forgiveness that you will sanctify us and you will enable us with the power to defeat temptation and sin and empower us to live our life, which is Christ's life in us, in righteousness and in inte with integrity for the next time, next time period until we have this time of communion again. We pray that your Holy Spirit will fill us now again, take control of our whole being, not just spirit, but the whole soul and the body, our conscience, our mind, our will, our heart, and our strength, our body, our life, our thoughts, and our behavior, so that we will think as Christ does. We will love what you love and hate what you hate, and we will live a life as Christ would live, with love and sacrifice for your glory and for others' benefit. And in that, we shall have the greatest benefit 
the joy for the eternity to come. For that purpose, we come here to pray. And may that prayer be in your will, may it be fulfilled now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Please distribute these elements. In our communion devotional, we have been surveying the life of, tell me, Abraham, okay? For uh, I believe I was illumined by God to discover this for the first time in church history. I haven't read anybody found this, that the life of Abraham parallels the eight blessings of the Beatitudes. And uh, when he came out of war, he recognized he was poor in spirit. That's why he followed God's call. When he went to Egypt and lied and lost his wife, he grieved, he mourned for his sin, and that's why he was comforted by God's grace, that God chose him despite who he was, not because of who he was. And then he uh, demonstrated meekness when he let Lot choose the land, and then uh, God gave him a literal promise that wher wherever you see in a high place, you will own it you will inherit the earth. And then he decided to hunger and thirst for life, uh, for righteousness. Okay? And he did several right things and one wrong things and several more righteous things. And then that's the first four steps of the Beatitude, which basically is parallel to our life. That God made us a seeker when we know that we are poor in spirit. He made us a believer when we mourn for our sin and comforted by grace. Then we showed our proof of salvation when we become meek because we know who we are, we will inherit the earth. And then we are on a lifetime pursuit of righteousness because we want to be like our Father in heaven who is perfect. We know we never reach perfect perfection in this life, but we never stop trying. Not for our glory, but for Christ's glory. Right. So that's the first four steps of salvation. Okay? That's giving us a new life. But in the latter four blessings, God takes away our old life. So I will make this illustration that God inserts liquid gold into our rock, the old life, and it melts the old rock, breaks it. Okay? And then he takes away the rocks uh, in the later stages. And at the end, we are pure gold, ready to heaven. Okay, sure heaven. So the first of the uh, latter four steps for spiritual life uh, is blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy okay, or receive mercy. Okay. And then how did Abraham have that? Well, when God asked him to get uh, circumcised and then God says, 
you be perfect before me, and then I will come and visit you. You know, you cannot be perfect forever, but you can be perfect for a while. <laughs> he was perfect for a while, and then God came and visited him with two angels, right? One is actually God and two angels. Three persons came and visited him, and he treated God with the right treatment. He gave him a sacrifice, you know, a, 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 I guess it was a bull, right, reserved for New Year's Day. He killed that day, and then he gave him fine uh, flour made thing. So that's kind of like the blood sacrifice and the, uh, the grain offering. Okay? And then God promised him that next year this time your wife will have a son. And they laughed. And God said, you're going to name your son Laughter, Itak, okay? Isaac. Okay? Just to remember that <laughs> it's a grace. Okay? And then after that, God sa said to himself, since I count Abraham as my friend, I will tell him what I'm going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah, for it involves his family member, Lot. So God told Abraham that he will destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going to send angels down there to see if they are really as wicked as the news heard in heaven, which they are, and then God's going to punish. But Lot and his family are in there. So what did Abraham do? He prayed for Lot and his family. What did Lot do to Abraham? He departed. He actually got an inheritance from the, the, the uh, money that uh, Abraham got due to selling his wife in Egypt. And then, well, Lot inherited and departed. And then Lot was asked to choose the best land, and he chose the best land in his sight. Um, good for the sheep, but he didn't count in that it was, if it's best, best land is usually already chosen by others. So the Canaanites already chose that, and Sodom and Gomorrah was very morally corrupt, and he didn't count that in, so he chose by sight, not by faith. And then they, the, the two families now kind of departed because they're all independent by themselves. They're, they're s slaves um, or servants fight each other. So Lot wasn't really good to Abraham, although Abraham was good to Lot. So now when Lot is about to suffer, rather than despising him and, and, and just casting him aside, Abraham prayed for Lot. And not just once, he prayed for three rounds, okay? First of all, he said, well, God, I know you are just. You will not punish the righteous together with the unrighteous. And uh, so, if the city has 50 righteous men, would you spare the city? God says, I will. And Abraham said, how about 30? No, I will. Then how about 10? And God still said, I will spare the city. And then Abraham stopped. You know, when you pray to God and you're pestering like that, um, there is a there's a possibility that you make God angry with you and just, you know, not answering your prayer positively. So Abraham felt that I was pestering God. So he actually prayed for four rounds, 50, 30, 20, and 10. And uh, uh, he still did that because he was thinking for a lot and his family. Okay? And if Lot's family are all righteous, as they should be, see, they are. They, they believe, Lot believed in the God that Abraham believed. Okay? The problem is with Lot is that he never had his personal spiritual life. In a sense, he went to church with his uncle. <laughs> he sacrificed at the altars. When Abraham sacrificed, Lot also participated. He believed in the same God and participated in the religious ceremonies, but not because of his own initiative. He just followed the family tradition. So was he righteous by faith? In the New Testament, actually, I think it's, is it 1 Peter or 2 Peter said that Lot, 2 Peter says Lot was righteous man. Yeah. And uh, he went to Sodom uh, with the goal to reform the society. He wanted to become their elder. He sat at the gate. He wants to persuade them to reject their lifestyle, which has a lot of sin. 
But was he received by the society? No, they rejected him. Why? Because he didn't have the power from above. His personal faith was right. He was counted righteous by his faith. But his, he, because he didn't have personal spiritual life, he didn't have power from above. So his ideal to reform society went, went in, in, in vain. And the, the society actually reformed his family okay, to become worldly. And how many people does his family have? I counted, there are 10. He and his wife, he has two un, you know, unmarried daughters. He has um, uh, two daughters and who have their husbands. And then and he has two uh, sons. So altogether there are 10 uh, family. So Abraham was thinking, if all of the family of uh, Abraham, of Lot, was righteous, then God would spare the city, okay? And together with Lot's family. And that's why Abraham did. And he did that with a risk to himself. So that is mercy, okay? So what is mercy? Mercy is not counting other sins, okay? What they deserve, hopefully they don't have it, okay? That's giving mercy. And when God says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, it's basically saying to believers, after you are saved, after you obtain eternal life by faith in Christ, do you still need mercy from God in this life? In other words, do you still sin? Possibly. Not necessarily, but possibly. Yes. If you're realistic, you will remain humble. Because the beginning of a spiritual life is humility. You know you are poor in spirit. You don't deserve eternal life. And then that humility should remain after your salvation. You know after you're saved, you're not perfect yet. You still need mercy from God. Since you need mercy, you give mercy. That's God's standard for the saved people, true believers. You know you need mercy. Therefore, you need to give mercy in order to get mercy. Okay? So this is not talking about whether you are forgiven for, all, for eternal life. You are forgiven already through faith. You are counted righteous through faith. But about your sins in life, there are consequences. Do you want to have these consequences of sin being eliminated or at least reduced? Y you do, right? We can choose whatever we want to choose, but you're not free to avoid the consequences of your choices, right? But these consequences can be reduced or eliminated by God's mercy. Don't you want that? Yeah, I mean, everybody have times of driving with, uh, I mean, exceeding speed limit. But what do you receive from the police can be different. Sometimes it could be a warning, sometimes it could be a ticket, right? When it gives you a warning, that's a mercy. Don't you want that? Right? <laughs> so, uh, same thing with, with, um, with this, with, with mercy in, in life. So, Christians, okay, we are forgiven. We have eternal life. We're counted righteous. This doesn't mean we don't sin. We don't necessarily sin. We can live a life with integrity if we hear the voice, still small voice of the Holy Spirit all the time. The problem is we don't all the time. We do it sometime, but not all the time. And when you don't, there are times where your thoughts, words, and actions will not be the way it should be. And that's a sin. And, that, and all sins have consequences. S big sins have big consequences. Small sins have small consequences. But all consequences are bad. So you want to reduce that. And the way to do that is you ask for mercy. Okay? For the known sins, you repent. For the unknown sins, you, you get a blanket confession and ask for mercy. And how do you obtain the mercy? By giving mercy. Okay. So Abraham gave mercy. Did he obtain mercy? Right after this, he, did, he was weak in the flesh again when he was living in fear of people taking his wife. So he lied, lied again that his wife was his sister. And this time, Abimelech, this uh, king of the, um, what's called, uh, what do you call it, the Bible calls it. But anyway, this Gentile king who was um, possibly, you know, taking his wife, he had a dream. God intervene, intervened before he could do anything. 
And then God said, you are a dead man because he's a prophet. And then you need to ask him to pray for you so you'll be forgiven. Otherwise, all of your family will become infertile. <laughs> and so he, he came to his, his senses. He says, Abraham, what did you do to me? Why do you lie? Well, Abraham said, I was in fear and so on. So this time, God did, gave mercy. Why did God intervene this time before Sarah was taken? Because God just promised Next year, this time, your wife will have a son, right? If she was taken, the son's bloodline will be in question, right? So that's why God intervened first, okay? And then, uh, uh, all in all, Abraham gave mercy by praying for Lot. He received mercy by God intervening before his wife was defiled, okay? So uh, this fits the fifth Beatitude, okay? As we go on, we're going to see all eight fit together. That's why I believe this is not a coincidence. This is Christ summarizing from biblical history principles as the Beatitude. So the Beatitudes are cross-testamental, both Old Testament and New Testament. It's a universal path to salvation and righteousness. And that's why it's very important. The neglect of that is a big loss for the church. So let's restore that. Okay. So because of that, remember, Christ is the one who paved the way for salvation. And then the essential, central event of all history is Jesus Christ gave up his life for us on the cross. And then we take this bread in remembrance of that. And Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross, and uh, it covers us from God's wrath. We take this drink in remembrance of that. And because of what Christ did on the cross, we are able to walk the path of the Beatitudes from this life to next life, from sin to righteousness. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for coming into this world from above. Thank you for demonstrating us who God is, what truth is, and what love is. Thank you for obeying your Father to the uttermost and love us to the uttermost by giving up your life, your physical life, which didn't deserve death because you had no sin. But you gave it up because of obedience and love. For that, we are grateful. We are the recipient of your grace and your love, and we have been given a covenant, the new covenant, which includes the total forgiveness of our sins, past, current, and future. And uh, it includes giving us a new spirit and giving us God's spirit. And it includes us um, letting all of us having a personal relationship through you with God. We have become family members of God, no longer enemy, no longer subject. We are now family members, and, and no longer slaves. For this, it's all your work because of love. For this, we are grateful. We come to you to commemorate this new covenant, and today is a renewal. We pray that we, as we have confessed our sins and you forgive all of them, and we are filled again with the Holy Spirit, we shall live on the path of righteousness with integrity so that our conscience will not accuse us and we will be able to demonstrate your life to the world. We pray that the world seeing your life will be attracted to you. At least the elect will be. We pray in your holy name.